this is actually very nice. So I had the pleasure of sharing a graduate uh, office with Olivia at Emory University, where she was an NSF graduate fellow. Um, she was also awarded the Schodel Graduate Research Award uh, at Emory for her uh, numerous works in partitions and um, also a beautiful uh, application of techniques of mock modular forms to the indivisibility of uh, class numbers of imaginary quadratic fields. Uh, after Emory, Olivia was a Heilbronn Research Fellow at the University of Bristol, and then a J.L. Dube Research Assistant Professor at the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. Um, uh, while at those places, she continued working on problems having to do with class numbers and partitions, uh, in particular uh, with a focus on the existence and scarcity, scarcity of uh, congruences and, and Ramanujan type congruences. Uh, Olivia is now an assistant professor at Tulane University. Um, and so, yeah, I've been very lucky to, to have been learning from her for, I guess now it's been the past seven years since I, I first learned what a modular form was um, uh, to, to this moment now. Um, and today we'll continue learning. So she will be speaking about theta type congruences for partitions and colored partitions. Yeah, thanks for being here. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, yeah, today I'm going to tell you about some joint work with Scott Algren and Martin Rom, um, as well as some joint ongoing work with Alex Caioni, um, Jack Chen, Maddie DeLuia, Oscar Gonzalez, and uh, Jamie Sue. So they are, these are all um, in the, the bottom row. They are all um, undergraduates except for Oscar Gonzalez. Um, and uh, before I begin, I just want to um, thank the organizers for their um, patience and for all their work in putting together this, um, this uh, awesome conference. And it's really exciting to finally uh, be here uh, doing this together. Um, is it, uh, do I click? Um, oh, yeah, there we go, okay. It should work with the keys now, yeah. Okay, great. So a partition of N is a non-increasing sequence of positive integers whose sum is N. Um, the number of partitions of n is p of n. So for example, I went with the classic n equals 4 partition example. Um, the partitions of 4 are 4, 3 plus 1, 2 plus 2, 2 plus 1 plus 1, and 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1. Therefore, p of 4 equals 5. Um, an r-colored partition of n is a partition in which each term is assigned one of r colors. The number of r-colored partitions of n is p r of n. So for example, for the two colored partitions of two, we take the two partitions of two, just two and one plus one, and we color each of the terms, say red or blue. So we've got blue two, red two, one red one, one blue one, two red ones, two blue ones. So P two of two is five. Okay, and when I say um, a congruence here's for, for partitions, here's what I mean. So a congruence for our colored partitions is a property of the form P sub R of AN plus T is zero mod L for all integers N, where A and T are fixed integers. And in this talk, L is always prime, even if I don't say it's prime. So I'm not gonna be considering um, composite um, moduli here or uh, prime powers um, in this talk. And um, yeah, this, this phenomenon for, for partitions has been studied since Ramanujan. Um, and uh, using modular forms and Q-series and combinatorics. And uh, today there are still a lot of questions that are easy to ask and hard to answer um, that, are, that are very interesting. And I find it very enjoyable to work on these problems because you get to use um, a lot of um, theoretical machinery and you get to observe a lot of kind of striking patterns. So in the first part of the talk, I'm gonna give kind of a some, give some historical background, um, not a comprehensive list of every result known in this area, um, but actually several members of the, the audience um, in person and virtual have, have worked on um, questions in this area. So, you know, if you have anything to, to add, please feel free to jump in. Um, the story kind of begins with Ramanujan, who showed that uh, for all n, we have these three uh, surprising patterns. P of 5n plus 4 is 0 mod 5. P of 7n plus 5 is 0 mod 7. And P of 11n plus 6 is 0 mod 11. And Ramanujan proved this using um, some um, 
cool manipulations of the generating function for P of n and uh, relating this to the Eisenstein series, E2, E4, and E6, and their derivatives. Um, and, he later, um, and, and later, this, the, these patterns were explained combinatorially via the rank function of Dyson and the crank function of Andrews and Garvin. So you might wonder, looking at these patterns, are there other congruences like Ramanujan's? So other than Ramanujan's three congruences, are there any primes L and integers T such that PR of LN plus T is zero mod L for all N? When R equals one, um, so you just have the ordinary partition function when R equals one, the answer is no by the work of Algren and Boylan in 2003. Um, and when R is greater than one, many examples are no. And I'll talk more about those in, in a second. Um, and we're going to call throughout the talk a congruence of this type, a Ramanujan type congruence. And just to be clear that the thing that distinguishes Ramanujan type congruences from, from the others is that this L over here, I don't know if you can, yeah, you can see them. This L and this L are the same number as opposed to this L being some other number. Okay, um, so what is known about Ramanujan type congruences? So in 1992, Kimming and Olson showed that there are Ramanujan type congruences whenever L divides R and R is congruent to minus one mod L or R is congruent to minus, R, minus three mod L. Uh, Boylan and also Dossi and Wagner found more Ramanujan type congruences using CM modular forms um, in a way that's uh, kind of relevant to the examples we'll look at at the end of, of this talk. Um, uh, very recently, Roland and Tripp and Wagner used um, the crank function to combinatorially explain uh, many of these congruences. Okay, what about non-Ramanujan type congruences? Congruences with, with different shapes. Okay, so Atkin back in 1967 found congruences for small L, such as L equals five, of the form P of L Q cubed N plus T is zero mod L. Um, ono in 2000 showed that for any L greater than or equal to five, when, whenever someone enters the room, I'm just letting them in. I hope that's yeah. good. Okay. Um, whenever um, uh, L is greater than or equal to five uh, in this prime, there are infinitely many primes Q and integers T with um, the Legendre symbol one minus 24 T on L is zero. And uh, we have the, the Ramanujan, we have the congruence P of LQ to the fourth N plus T is zero mod L. And then Algren and Ono um, in 2001 generalized this for um, one minus 24 T on L is negative one. So they found they found that there are infinitely many congruences um, of, of this type with, with, um, with T in this square class, mod L. And then Trenier generalized Ono and Algren's work to other modular forms, so that we know that this happens for all weakly holomorphic modular forms. Okay, and all of these, well, the last three works, Ono, Algren, and Trenier, um, use the Shimura correspondence and Galois representations associated to modular forms of integral weight. And very recently, Algren and Allen and Tong found similar examples, well, examples similar to Atkins using uh, different properties of these Galois representations. Okay, so all of these, these pre previous works um, are about showing that congruences exist, right? Finding examples of congruences and classes of congruences. So, you know, you might wonder, have we found all of them after a while? How do we know when we found all of them? Um, and so to, to try to classify the congruences that can occur, we need restrictions. Um, we need to know the following. Like what restrictions are there on the values A, T, R, and L for which P, R of A, N plus T is zero mod L for all N? Radu famously showed in 2012 that if R equals one, then L can't be two or three. Um, this was um, for, for L equals two, a famous conjecture. And we have um, two useful restrictions that were conjectured by Algren and Ono for P of N initially in 2001, uh, proved by Radu for, for P of N in 2013, and then generalized to other eight equations by Anderson in 2014. Um, and, and these will be you know, relevant to this talk. So L has to divide A and the Legendre symbol um, R times um, R minus 24 T on L um, does not equal one. 
So it has to be zero or, or negative one. Okay, so here's the, the main question for this talk. Um, so in all non an all known non Ramanujan type congruences with a maximal arithmetic progression a n plus d, one has um, a equals l times q to the n, where, where q is prime and n is at least three. So here's a question Do there exist distinct primes q and l that are at least five and integers t such that pr of l q n plus d is zero mod l for all n? So kind of in between the Ramanujan type congruences and the congruences studied by Ono and Algren. Okay. So when, when R equals one and L equals two or three, the answer is no by the work of Redu. Um, and of course, you know, if we have a Ramanujan type congruence, we know that this holds trivially, right? We know that this relation one holds trivially if PR of LN plus T is zero mod L um, without the Q. So um, from now on, we will, um, my, some of my um, collaborators and I have been calling um, congruences of the form of one that do not follow trivially from Ramanujan type congruences, uh, theta type congruences. So the main question that we are interested in in this talk is do theta type congruences exist? And when R equals one, um, so this is kind of a, an outline for the rest of the talk. Um, my work with Algren and um, Rom um, suggests or implies that the answer is uh, probably not. It seems like the answer is no, based on numerical data and a result that such congruences, if they exist, are expected to be scarce. And these results will be described in the, the scarcity section of the talk up here. Uh, but when R equal is greater than one, um, with um, my, my collaborators, um, we have found that there are infinitely many uh, theta type congruences for, for several values of R. And um, we'll, we'll show several examples in the, uh, the last section, the R, the R greater than one so, um, so, example. So you section. mean there's specific values of R where you know for a fixed value of R? Uh, yes. Okay, so um, before I can tell you about um, that work, um, I need to go over some, some background from the theory of modular forms. So the, um, the, the, the colored partition numbers are connected to the theory of modular forms via the dedicated eta function. So um, we'll use the standard notation Q equals E to the two pi I Z, where Z um, throughout the talk is in the upper half plane, um, consisting of complex numbers with positive imaginary part. And then the dedicate eta function is famously um, given by this infinite product Q to the one over 24 times the product from n equals one to uh, over n equals um, one to infinity of one minus Q to the n. And the eta function famously uh, satisfies this transformation law with respect to SL2Z. So for all gamma um, equals ABCD um, in SL2Z, we have eta of AZ plus B over CZ plus D is equal to a new eta of gamma defined below times CZ plus D to the um, one half times eta of Z, where here um, new eta of, of gamma um, is given by, by this formula here, where this, um, this fraction is the Kronecker symbol. And um, yeah, we assume, uh, I'm, and here I'm, I'm using the notation E of X is E to the two pi I X. So this transformation law tells us that eta is a uh, weight one half modular form uh, with respect to this new eta multiplier system. Okay, and then the connection to colored partition numbers is through the generating function. So the, the colored partition numbers um, have as their generating function this, this infinite product. So we see the um, equation at the, at the top here, you simply write each uh, uh, factor on the right over here as a geometric series. And then you um, kind of distribute and group together terms um, with the same exponent. And, um, and you see that you, you get the, uh, the uh, nth coefficient is PR of n. Um, and this is equal to Q to the R over 24 times eta to the minus R of Z. So in our work to study the divisibility properties of PR then, 
we want to consider spaces of modular forms that have the same transformation law as uh, eta to the minus r. Okay, so that's what I'll define next. Okay, so we want to know about modular forms with the new eta multiplier system. So we'll let k be um, a half integer. Um, then mk of new eta to the n is the space of uh, functions f from the upper half planes to the complex numbers, such that f <coughs> is holomorphic. f is bounded as the imaginary part um, of, of z goes to infinity. And uh, for all gamma equals a, b, c, d, and s, l, 2, z, we had this transformation law where if we um, define this, this slash operator by um, c, z plus d to the minus k times f of um, a, z plus b over c, z plus d, then for all gamma in s, l, 2, z, um, this is equal to just new eta of gamma to the n times f of c. So, um, you know, if n equals zero, then of course you just have the, the usual uh, transformation law for, um, uh, for, the, for the, the most classical modular forms. And uh, more generally, you know, you'll have some 24th root of unity here. Okay, and the F in, in this space, we call the weight K modular forms with respect to mu eta to the N. Okay, and I, I'll need to refer to the cusp forms a couple cusp forms a couple of times. So just let's just quickly recall that the cusp forms, um, the space of cusp forms s k new eta to the n is the space of functions f and m k new eta to the n, for which um, the the limit um, as the imaginary part of, of tau goes to infinity of f of tau is equal to zero. So instead of just being um, bounded as the imaginary part goes to infinity, they actually vanish as the imaginary part goes to infinity. And yeah, we call the functions in the space the cusp forms of weight k with respect to new eta to the n. Okay, um, and then a, a, a standard, um, very easy to, to prove fact is that any f in mk of new eta to the n has a Fourier expansion of, um, of a particular form. We can write f as the sum from n equals zero to infinity of a of n times q to the n over 24. We need the um, n over 24 because we have the, the new eta multiplier system. Okay, and then we also have these, um, I'm gonna refer to a few times, um, a few linear maps that act um, nicely on modular forms. Particularly, they act nicely on the, um, in a nice way on the, the Fourier expansions. So we have the, the UM operator, which um, just, just replaces the, the nth Fourier coefficient with the m nth Fourier coefficient. We have the, um, the VM operator, which sort of does the opposite. And then we have um, the twisting operator um, down here at the bottom, where if you take a Dirichlet character um, and, you, and you sort of insert a factor of chi of n um, into, this, into this sum. And these maps are, um, very useful for restricting to a, a, a specific arithmetic progression, um, which is of course exactly what you wanna do when you're studying congruences. Okay, and these are also um, important maps because we can express the HECA operators in terms of them. So Q is a, a prime that's at least five and R is co-prime to 24. Then we have the index Q squared HECA operator um, that fixes the space of weight k um, or weight k over two um, modular forms with respect to new eta to the r. And um, its action on Fourier coefficients is given by this formula here, which we can express sort of relatively succinctly as in terms of the uq squared operator, um, the um, twisting with respect to chi q, and the vq squared operator, where chi q is just n on q. Okay, and then um, we're looking at you know, Fourier coefficients mod L. So um, sort of um, we, we make use of some, some standard properties of modular forms mod L in our work. So if L is at least, um, so I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about um, modular forms modulo L. All right, so if we let L be um, a prime number, that's at least five, and we let K in this part of the talk be an integer and not a half integer, then we can define mk of fl to be the space of um, 
to be the intersection of the, the Fourier expansions we obtain from um, the, the, the modular forms in MK of one um, and the just the, the um, uh, power series over FL. So in other words, we take the reduction modulo L of all of the F in the, the um, space MK of one with L integral coefficients. And um, we view them as um, um, you know, a subalgebra of FL of Q. Okay, um, and then we have the structure theorem of swinnerton dyer that says that this that if we take sort of um, all of the modular forms um, modulo L um, over all of the weights, then this is generated. Um, then then it, the structure of this space is um, given by the the algebra of um, generated by E four and E six over F L modulo the modulo E L minus one minus one. Um, so E4 and E6 gener um, generate the um, ordinary space. So one way of viewing the, the first part of this theorem um, is that um, the, the kind of the only thing in the, the kernel of, of reduction here is EL minus one minus one. And this is also a direct sum over all of the residue classes mod L minus one um, of the modular forms with weight congruent to A mod L minus one. So if two modular forms um, are congruent to each other, then their weights have to be congruent mod L minus one. Okay, and then um, we also need some properties of filtrations, which were introduced by Zare um, in, uh, when he was um, constructing um, L attic modular forms. Okay, so if L is, um, a prime number that's at least five and k is an integer, then for a um, for f in mk of fl, the filtration of f is given by the, um, the infimum of the integers um, for which f is a, a modular form mod l of weight r. So that the smallest weight for which um, f is a, a modular form um, of that weight. So for example, E L minus one is a weight L minus one modular form, um, but it's also congruent to one mod L, so its filtration is zero. And one is because one is a, a weight zero modular form. Okay, and we, we need a couple um, useful properties that um, Sarah proved, um, like he said in some papers um, where he was defining um, L attic modular forms, but he showed that the filtrations act nicely with respect to some, um, some useful linear maps. Um, so Sarah showed that um, the filtration of F with UL is bounded by L plus um, the filtration of F minus one over L. And also, if we let theta be the Ramanujan theta operator, which is given by Q times the derivative with respect to Q, then we have this bound for the filtration of F with theta. Um, it's bounded by the filtration of F plus L plus one. And we actually have a quality here um, exactly when L does not divide the filtration of F. So um, we can use these operators to, um, to tell us about um, the weights of, our, of, of, um, of generating functions associated to our colored partition numbers. Okay, so um, in, in our work, uh, specifically, we use the following two generating functions. So we let FRL0 be the generating function, be this generating function of, um, of colored um, partition numbers where, um, where, um, the, where N, the, this Legendre symbol is equal to zero. So L divides R times R minus 24 N. And we let FL, um, FRL minus one um, be the analogous generating function. Only other difference other than the difference between this Legendre symbol here is that we um, um, uh, have an, ha don't have a, a factor of, of L in this denominator here. Okay, and you might wonder about um, the other Legendre symbol, but again, by the um, work mentioned um, earlier of Anderson, we know that um, we don't have any congruences for um, the, when the Legendre symbol is equal to one. 
So we don't need a generating function for that case. And then, yeah, this tells us, these tell us um, about um, congruences in particular. Um, FRL of zero is zero modulo L, precisely when we have a Ramanujan type congruence um, for this, um, for the, for the uh, T corresponding to this Legendre symbol, specifically PR of LN um, minus um, L squared minus one over 24, um, congruent to zero mod L. Okay, um, so we can um, basically show that these generating functions are congruent to modular forms in specific um, of specific weights and specific spaces. So um, I'm going to um, let K L zero and K L minus one be these be, be given by these two functions, L minus two over two and L squared minus two over two. So these are gonna be the weights of my generating functions. Um, and I'm only gonna do the um, R equals one case here because it, is um, a lot nicer, um, but we show that if L is at least prime and delta is zero or negative one, then there's a modular form with coefficients I'll, I'll call A L delta of N. In this space, um, A uh, with, with this weight defined at the top um, with respect to mu eta to the minus one, for which um, F of um, this, this generating function F one L delta is congruent to this modular form, modulo L. And this is all using um, the properties of filtrations um, and um, examining the, the weights of, um, of, 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 um, of these functions. Um, yeah, using twisting and applying the, the UL operators. And um, we can generalize this for R greater than one um, for um, FRL delta under the condition that FRL delta is supported modulo L on positive indices. So remember, I've got this, um, this, uh, this function over here because I have this, this shift here. So PR of N, you know, this is gonna, we, we just consider that to be zero if N is not a, a non-negative integer. Um, but there's no reason that, you know, we couldn't have um, negative indices um, appearing here, especially if R is very large, right? And so, um, so we need this, this non-vanishing condition. Um, and uh, I want to give credit here. So I know Robert has worked out some of these cases in, um, in uh, upcoming work, especially for relatively large L. Um, so, um, so, yeah. Okay. All right. Um, and our scarcity results, so we apply different, so yeah, for our scarcity results, we take these generating functions and we apply different tools from the theory of modular forms to them. Um, we make use, significant use of the Q expansion principle, which says the following due to Deline and Rappaport from 1973. Okay, and it says the following. So let's let L be prime and let's let K and N be positive integers. Um, then let's let pi be a prime ideal above L in a number field F, um, which contains all the nth roots of unity. All right, and now we suppose that F is an MK of gamma N. So this is the only slide where I refer to um, congruent subgroups um, other than SL2Z. But if we suppose that F is an MK gamma N and has uh, pi integral coefficients, and we suppose that gamma is in um, gamma uh, zero of L to the M, where L to the M is the highest power of L dividing N, then we can say the following. Um, we know that F um, hit with gamma, which also has a Fourier expansion. We know that its Fourier expansion has pi integral coefficients. And we know that F is zero mod pi, um, exactly when F hit with gamma is zero mod pi. So the Q expansion principle relates the um, Q expansions modulo L at different cusps. Okay, and so using the Q expansion principle, we prove a couple of restrictions on theta type congruences. Um, one, first of all, we show that there are no theta type congruences where Q divides 24 T minus one, so that this Legendre symbol has to be one or negative one. Okay, and then we've, um, we also show the following, um, and I'll call this the UQ VQ relationship later on. So if we fix a delta equal to either zero or negative one, and epsilon 
um, equal to um, plus or minus one. Then if there is a theta type congruence with these two square classes, so one minus 24 T on L is equal to Delta and um, we'll say 24 T minus one on Q is equal to Epsilon. Then we have this relationship between F of um, one L Delta hit with UQ and F of one L Delta hit with VQ modulo L. I'm missing a, a one in the, the subscript over here. Um, but yeah, this should be F one L Delta. And yeah, F uh, hit with UQ is just a, a simple multiple of F hit with VQ. Okay, and this is um, one, one reason this is kind of interesting is that this holds for theta functions. So this is maybe the first hint of why we call these theta type congruences um, because um, this relation that we derived um, is satisfied by all theta functions. Okay, and the method here, um, is um, the Q expansion principle. And to, to prove the, um, the, the um, Q expansion, um, to, to apply the Q expansion formula principle, we use a, a Q expansion formula um, due to Radu from 2013 um, and compute the, uh, um, the, the Q expansion um, for a, a certain modular form uh, that we obtain from, from our generating function F1L delta at the cusp one over Q. So that's, so, uh, that's the idea here. A quick question. Mm -hmm. uh, so when you say holds for theta functions, which type of theta functions were? Um, so like ordinary theta functions? just ordinary theta functions, like in, in um, so yeah. like, yeah, Jacobi theta function, um, like. Um, any character. Uh, yeah, yeah, any character, any of the like theta psi um, theta functions that are weight one half or three halves. I have a question too. Yeah. Um, so I just want to make sure I'm understanding what the F of one L deltas are. Is this a statement about what happens when I with one, or is this something? Yeah. Is this a similar thing true for higher value pi? Okay. So yeah, R equals one here. Um, I think it can probably be generalized for um, other values of R. Um, we didn't work that work it out in this case, um, but I think it can be done. Um, Actually, you could use the, the Q expansion formulas of Radu to do that. He did, um, he worked them out. They're a little messy. I mean, they're a little, um, they're, they're involved, you know, but um, they are, um, he's, he's, it, he's worked that out for, for, I think, arbitrary values of R. So I think this probably generalizes um, nicely, at least for R and 24 co prime. Great, any other questions? Great, okay. Um, Okay, so then sort of a, the sort of the strongest result in this in this direction that we have shown is that um, if L is prime and at least five, and we fix delta, okay, let's let S be the set of primes Q for which we have a theta type congruence with um, one minus twenty four T on L is equal to delta. So the, the so S is the, the primes Q for which we have a theta type congruence, and one of the following is true. Either S has density zero, or we have that the number of Ns up to X for which, for which the, um, the coefficient of um, our F one L delta is um, uh, not divisible by L. This is bounded by the square root of X times log X. So um, a relatively small number of, of coefficients um, are allowed to be not divisible by L. And additionally, the generating function is annihilated by all of the Q squared heck operators for Q congruent to negative one modulo L. Okay. And I should, I should point out that the right-hand side um, of three is about root X if F1 L delta is a theta function. So, you know, more theta behavior. Um, so, yeah. But um, this, this second condition four is sort of useful for, um, uh, we can use it to, to rule out this, this second possibility here in this, in this or statement um, in a lot of cases. So we can use four to rule out the second possibility for specific L. In particular, we um, show that for L between 17 and 10,000, S must have density zero. Um, why did I leave out L equals 13? <laughs> Um, so unfortunately, a, well, a barrier is that a, a work of Atkin um, implies that um, F1L 
one thirteen negative one actually does satisfy this condition. That function is annihilated by um, by all of the q squared HECA operators, where q is minus one mod thirteen. Um, but we know there are no cases um, when well, we know s has density zero for the delta equals zero case. Okay, and I want to talk a little bit about some of the tools and the ingredients and um, kind of give a little bit of a, a, a sketch of the proof here. So we use the arithmetic large sieve. In particular, we use this version of the arithmetic large sieve um, proved by Montgomery in 1968. So we let um, R be a, a non-empty set of Z positive integers in the interval from one to N plus one. So um, a, a, yeah, that R is a, a set contained in this interval of, of positive integers um, of size Z. And for each prime P, we let WP be the number of residue classes modulo P, which do not contain any element of R. So um, say we know for whatever reason that for a bunch of primes P, um, R can't have any, any elements um, that are um, in certain residue classes modulo P. Okay, then for x greater than one, and we, we can choose x. Um, we have that z is bounded by um, n to the one half uh, plus x squared over t, where t is um, the sum over um, square free q up to x um, of the product of primes p dividing q of um, wp over p minus wp. So you get to choose x, but um, depending on how you choose x, you know that your choice of x is going to affect t, right? So you you have to um, you know be careful in how you choose x to get uh, to get a bound that's as, um, as as good as you'd like. Okay, and we use that, and also this um, square class that uh, this this result of Radu from 2012, which um, essentially shows that the congruences have a square class structure. So if we have PR, PR of a n plus t is zero mod l for all n, um, where a and 24 are co-prime, then if one minus 24 t prime is congruent to one minus 24 t times h squared modulo a, where h and a are co-prime, then PR of a n plus t prime is zero mod l for all n. So basically, if I have one congruence, then I get a whole bunch of other congruences for all the t prime where um, for which one minus 24 t prime is in the same square class as one minus 24 t modulo a. Okay, and just to unpack a little bit what this means um, for theta type congruences, if we have a theta type congruence, PR LQN plus t is zero mod L, this means we must have PR of N is zero mod L for any N for which um, this Legendre symbol um, PR of 24N on L um, is the same as um, the Legendre symbol R minus 24T on L. And also, um, as well as um, uh, the Legendre symbol R minus 24N on Q being the same as the Legendre symbol R minus 24T on Q. So all of these numbers have to be zero mod L um, if they live in certain square classes. Okay, so how do we use this to prove our theorem? Um, I want to give just a quick sketch here. So let's let F1 L delta be the, the um, modular form as above um, with these uh, congruent to this, um, uh, with, with, with Fourier coefficients congruent to A L delta of N. Um, for this slide, let's, let's assume Q is in S. And let's let epsilon Q be the genre symbol one minus 24 T on Q. Okay, then using um, our the UQ VQ relation we just derived using the Q expansion principle and the square class property, we show that um, given this assumption that Q is an S and we have a theta type congruence, the um, expansion for F um, one L delta is of this shape. It's supported on ends where N on Q is equal to negative epsilon negative um, epsilon Q and ends where um, Q squared divides N. So we get a specific, um, yeah, all, all of the, um, um, yeah, we have two the, these um, restrictions on the, the Fourier expansion, modulo L. 
Okay, and so one way of looking at this is that each Q and S imposes a quadratic condition on the N um, for which um, AL delta of N is not a multiple of L um, in order for AL delta of N to um, be indivisible by L. The Legendre symbol N on Q is, has to equal either negative epsilon Q or Q squared has to divide N. Okay, so if S has positive density, then um, using all these quadratic conditions, the arithmetic large sieve bounds the number of N that can satisfy all of these conditions. And that establishes the uh, bound on the number of indivisible coefficients. Okay, and on the other hand, um, for every prime Q, not necessarily an S, um, there is an N, that, call it NQ, that um, produces a square class restriction on the Q in S. Or we show that a stronger version of the UQ VQ relationship must hold for F1L delta. So if the first case occurs infinitely often, then we get infinitely many quadratic restrictions on Q and S, um, which implies um, that S has density zero. Um, so if S has positive density, um, then the stronger version of the UQ VQ relation holds for all but finitely many Q. And from the strong UQ VQ relation, after another Q expansion principle calculation, we have this, um, th this HECA property that F1 L delta is annihilated by the Q squared HECA operator for Q congruent to negative one mod L. Okay, and then, and that is, um, we show is true for, um, for all but finally many Q. Um, and then the Shimura correspondence and the theory of Galois representations associated to modular forms implies that this has to then be true for all of the Q congruent to, to negative one mod L. It couldn't be true for all but a finite number. Uh, which establishes the HECA condition. Okay, so I'll, I'll end this section of the talk with just a little bit of numerical data. So using the, the square class property, we're able to show that um, apart from the Ramanujan congruences, okay, well, actually, um, there are no, we, we show that there are no theta type congruences for L up to 10 cubed and Q up to 10 to 13, or L up to 10 to the fourth and Q up to 10 to the ninth. So we can extend our um, L range a little bit, but at the cost of our Q range. Okay, so to sort of summarize um, what we've shown, um, it, it seems like there are no theta type congruences when R equals one, but a barrier to proving this is that um, all of the conditions on F1 L R delta that we derive are also satisfied by theta functions. And there's no reason to think that um, you know um, that this generating function couldn't be congruent to a theta function, even though we've tried a lot of examples and that doesn't seem to be what happens. And um, when R is greater than one, that's exactly what happens in a lot of examples. So um, yeah, in this last uh, part of the talk, I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about some um, what happens for other values of R. So Let's start with R equals three and L equals seven. In this case, there's a theta type congruence for every Q. And the table below shows the, the T values for the first several values of Q. You see that the, the T values are growing, right? The, in fact, the T values are exactly, the number of Ts are, is exactly Q minus one over two. And you can show that from the square class property. You get, um, yeah, Q minus one um, over two for the, the number of, um, um, residue classes, um, which are um, either one or minus one um, uh, mod, mod Q. And the reason that every Q appears is that um, F370 is a theta function. Okay, so here's how I'm gonna define theta functions just, just for this talk. So I'm gonna say that um, F um, um, in the space MK new eta to the R is a theta function if the Fourier expansion for F is of the form um, the sum over A of N times Q to the C N squared over 24. So we're supported, so the Fourier expansion is supported um, on some constant multiples of the squares. So for example, eta cubed is famously given by this formula, uh, minus four on N times N 
times q to the n squared over 24. And eta is given by the sum over n of 12 on n times q to the n squared over 24. And I think I'm missing a three in the um, in this in this uh, top expression for for eta cubed. So sorry about that. There should be a three here. Okay, and then based on the examples we've looked at, we sort of and maybe we're being a bit bold here, but we conjectured that all theta type congruences come from a congruence between um, F R L delta and a theta function. Uh, which means that if you have one theta type congruence, you have a theta type congruence for every single prime Q um, because um, yeah, your Fourier expansion is, is um, only supported on, on one squared class. Um, and, and this is true for, for all of the examples that we've looked at. Okay, so um, maybe some support for our conjecture for small values of R. So here's some, um, so here I have a table showing some values of R um, up to 23 and some L deltas. And um, our numerics um, show that um, for odd R up to 24, there are no theta type congruences with L and Q in the range um, from five to 6,133. I, I think it's the 800th prime, um, such that um, L does not divide R, except when R and L, um, R and L is, is in the table. So none, none for five, um, 13, 11, um, but um, just, for, just for these values of R and L. Okay. And we find that for R, L, and delta in the table, the function F, R, L, delta is congruent um, to a theta function. And specifically, it's congruent to, actually, this is a little bit off. It's not, uh, it's congruent to a constant multiple of either eta, eta cubed, eta to the L, or eta to the L squared minus eta, which are all theta functions. And, um, yeah, that it's congruent to a constant multiple of one of these four functions is true for all of the examples we've found so far. Okay, so, um, you know, uh, to, to describe these congruences a little bit more, I'm just going to quickly introduce some um, sort of mildly technical conditions. So, first of all, I'm going to say that um, condition C is satisfied by RL delta. If the Fourier expansion of FR delta is supported on positive indices. Okay, for L delta equals zero, we can show that this is true if, if this inequality is satisfied, also if L is, is larger than R. Um, this inequality over here is not as nice, but it is satisfied by, by more things um, with smaller values of L, which is um, where the vast majority of our um, examples are, are found. And for delta equals minus one, um, I don't know if there's as clean of a, of a, a way of, of putting it, but it's, it's true if R is less than 23, or actually less than or equal to 23. Okay, um, we also need this, this weight bound, which I'm gonna define to be this function, the R of L is, is this function, um, L minus one times this, this uh, floor function of this, this fraction minus R L over two, which we obtained um, as a, a weight for F R L zero by computing um, the filtration of um, delta to the R times L squared minus one over 24, get with UL. Okay, so with those conditions, um, we show that for, um, we have this table. We show that for R, L, and delta, satisfying condition A in the table, um, F, R, L, delta is congruent modulo L to a multiple of the corresponding um, function on the right. So here I've got my eta cubed, eta, eta to the L, eta to the L squared minus eta. Um, um, if, um, and, th and this is true, if um, each of these, these sets of conditions is, is satisfied. Um, also, unless this condition is um, on um, L mod 24 and R mod 24 holds, um, then the function has to be zero. So all of our theta functions, um, all of the theta type congruences we um, we've, we've observed um, are congruent to one of these functions. And um, uh, yeah, as you can see, um, aside from this 
what we we're, we're calling type one a um, there um, which is which is obviously infinite and very sim very um, simple um, the others are um, a little less a little less clear so it, it seems like one b and two um, are infinite it's pretty easy to find examples of them um, for one c and three and four um, I, we think those those might be finite it's not clear certainly the um, for satisfying these conditions um, in this type three row here um, the, the number of r and l is, is definitely finite but um, there, there may be, a, we, I think there may be other examples where you have A to the L that are, are not covered by this table. Okay, and just a little bit of, of data here. So let's, um, if we look at um, R going up to 501 and L going up to 1,223, we get um, eight example, um, 86 examples in, in the type two case. So the type two case is where you get ADA. Okay, and as you can see, um, L tends to stay pretty small with respect to R. So, you know, we, we checked L up to 1,223, but we didn't find any L greater than uh, 163. Um, and they seem to form a kind of a nice line here. Okay, and um, we, we think there are probably some, um, yeah, this, this data is, is full of patterns. So I have to give Ian um, credit here. Um, because um, well, when um, I, was, I was talking about some of this work, um, I guess a couple months ago, he had suggested looking at um, a pattern with um, the, the values for R modulo L. Um, and the idea with um, in our discussion was to see if there might be some connection with CM eta powers, um, which doesn't seem to be exactly what we're, what we're seeing, but there is definitely a pattern here. So if we look, um, over the, the examples on the, the previous slide that I had over here with, um, and we restrict to L at least 20, because if there aren't that many residue classes, it's modulo L, it's perhaps not a very meaningful thing to look at. Um, so if we, we look at those um, examples, then half of them, for half of them, we have minus R is congruent to four mod L. And then we have, um, for, for 12 of them, minus R is six mod L, for three of them, we get eight. For one, we get ten, and for four, we get we get twelve. And that's you know even when L is as large as um, you know in, in up here, we have several examples where um, there are um, you know at least fifty. Several examples where we're um, above a hundred. A couple, I think the, the max is one sixty three. But minus R mod L is always very small. So that to me suggests that there's maybe some more structure here, some more um, another way of, of looking at this that. Um, you know, maybe gives a, a nicer description of these congruences. Okay, so I'll just end. I, I just realized I'm over time. I'll just end with a couple future directions. Um, some future things we'd like to, we'd be interested in in the future is showing that there are no theta type congruences when r equals one. Um, if that's true, we're finding a counterexample. Um, we'd like to prove our conjecture or see if it's true for r greater than one. If um, these theta type congruences really only occur for theta functions. Um, I'd like to see if we can find some alternative dis descriptions for the families we, that, um, that we've observed that I was just describing. Um, and perhaps some, um, and perhaps a description that kind of offer some explanations for the, the types of patterns we're, we're observing. So nicer descriptions of the congruences that we have. And of course, uh, we'd, we'd like to see if there are other types of theta functions that can occur um, for these examples. And of course, you might wonder about generalizations too, uh, maybe to other eta quotients and weakly holomorphic modular forms, as well as to mock theta functions and other mock modular forms. All right, that's it. Thank you for listening. Great. Uh, thank you, Olivia, for the really interesting talk. Uh, do we have any questions? Yeah, I'm gonna actually, I'm gonna ask you, let's see if this works. Yeah. One of them we got working, just for the people on Zoom. So we're gonna ask you to use a microphone, uh, and if it doesn't work, uh, we might ask Olivia. Uh, 
question. All right. Hi, um, so that's really interesting, thanks, Olivia. Um, I'm wondering about um, the larger values are when you do have congruences. You say the thing, you say the thing, modulo powers of times. Yeah, we haven't thought about modulo powers of primes yet at all. Um, yeah, I think that would be that would be a really interesting thing to consider. But yeah, we haven't we haven't um, yeah we haven't explored that at all so far. Okay, so you always have these patterns like PR of something is zero mod L, PR of this other Aaron Hagrid is zero mod L. Has anybody looked at stuff like, oh, these are all one mod L or two mod L, or is there a reason to not? I don't know of any patterns of that of that form. Yeah, like it, yeah. So it, why why just zero mod L? Why not? Yeah, um, always congruent to some other residue class mod L. I don't know if anything like that's been observed or um, if, if that ever happens. Um, I don't know. Do, do you know? Or? No, I don't know that. I wonder if there's some underlying reason why it's not um, I'm not sure I have a good answer for that. Yeah. So Radu resolved at least modulo two, I think, does say there's nothing that's uh, nice progression that's like one mod two. But yeah, we're not aware of anything beyond that. Cool. And then just another thing. Um, I noticed the first table of the examples, like there seems to be a lot of T's that were showing up over and over again. I don't know if there's anything that. Like 15, 29, oh. what I doing with all of them. Oh, back here? Yeah. Hmm. Okay, so about 190. Lots of 92s. Lots of 92s. Maybe it's just because they're all one month seven, and it's not that many things that came in one seven, but it really seems like it's the same one that's showing up a lot. Yeah, so for, for each Q, you're going to have um, two possible square class conditions. Um, so you're, you're looking at. Um, so yeah, so yeah, you got the residue class mod L, and then for yeah, you, uh, the condition mod, mod Q is varying with respect to Q. So um, so yeah, even though you're looking at the same condition mod mod seven as Q varies, you're looking at different conditions mod mod Q, which I guess is um, I guess what I'm trying to say is I don't see a reason why you would see lots of T values over and over since you're getting um, different conditions. Um, yeah, for as you very cute. Um, but yeah, that might be interesting to look at. Thank you. Uh, yeah. uh, uh, could you go to the tape, the scatter plot you had? Yeah. I just was, you know, there's a, looks like there's a kind of a top line that bounds things. Do you know, like, what's the slope of that line or what that line is or what the significance is? I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm guessing that it, it, Somehow follows from this non-vanishing condition that this non-vanishing this inequality here somehow um, it determines that bounds the L's. Uh, we have to unpack that a little bit more, I think, to to say anything more about that line. But that would be my guess is that that's where that bound is coming from. Okay, and it did come up in your proof a little bit, but is there anything nice that happens uh, when the chronic or symbol is uh, you're looking at a square class dictated by the chronic or symbol being plus one? Is, uh, you have the zero case and the minus one case. Is there is there just nothing similar happens for the plus one? Or? Yeah, yeah. Well, we know we don't have any congruences for the plus one case oh. from um, um, yeah. Nick Anderson showed that, so that's why we only have to consider the zero and the minus one cases. Okay. Yeah. Well, really fascinating. You know, it's a long history of congruences to Eisenstein series. You know, you've got a lot of representation and stuff. And, uh, I don't know any nice similar theoretical things for congruences to theta functions, but Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, we have time for one more quick question. Oh, uh, oh, oh Robert's had his hand up for a while. Oh, sorry. Yeah, Robert wrote it. Actually, uh, we should have coffee breaks as well. To yeah. okay, hello. Uh, so I just wanted to have a brief comment on one of these things. 
there was a question of like congruences about something that's like non-zero. Uh, the answer is yes, some of these sorts of congruences do hold in a work that's about to come out. Uh, actually, uh, by me, uh, so I just wanted to briefly say that. Um, and it's like, okay, well, we can talk about it afterwards, but the answer is yes. Uh, secondly, there was, um, uh, I want just a very quick question about, there's something in sketch of the proof that where the Schmerer correspondence comes in and the UQ, UQ, UQ relation, I, I know we, we may have just one minute, could, could you briefly say a word about how those are related? Um, yeah, so we have some movement thoughts. Um, yeah, yeah. So, so we're doing, so we're taking our UQ VQ relation. We have a stronger version of it for um, sort of odd powers of, of Q. And um, from that, we, we do a Q expansion principle calculation um, where we are able to relate um, specifically the, the WQ operator action to, um, to, um, to, to the UQ and EQ operators. And um, we, we show um, using um, the Q expansion principle some, some other restrictions on the, the, the coefficients of the modular forms that come out of the Q expansion principle. And then um, when we um, examine the Q expansion principle, the Q expansion um, of uh, our generating function hit with those HECA operators, those restrictions um, give us zero. Great. All right, uh, let's thank Olivia again.